Okay. Okay. That was fun. That was a fun problem. Uh. Okay. Well, that's a past broadcast. Um, hmm. Okay, let's make sure everything's doing. Okay, yeah, that should be good. Um, close cam is good. Now let's make sure I am actually streaming. I have no idea what did the thing. Hmm. Oh, there we go. Are you working? I have no idea. Did yes. Okay. Now it works. Cool. Hi. Sweet. Okay. Pretty sure we're at the finale. Um, pretty sure. Uh, this definitely seems like, yeah, Tower of Owls. That seems like finale stuff. Let's see what, uh, I looked up the mysterious pale owl. His name is Stolas. We met him before. Why is the screen dark? Up oh, there we are. Okay, and we can't fly. Could probably jump. Do, do, do. Owls. This seems like an old owl temple. Huh. Hey, everybody. Guess this is where that stranger is hiding. But how do we get in? I went out. Oh, fuck. It responds to owls. Hmm. Well, that takes care of that problem. I guess we're actually doing this, huh? It's not like we have a choice. Yeah. Well, come on, gang. Let let us advance. Thank you. Hey, Getty. Hey, buddy. You ready for this? Yeah, I've got your back, man. Who needs flying, anyway? Let's go oh, together. Hmm. Let's see what this is all about. Oh shit. Oh my god, Roman statues of owls. Wait, actually... What is... Do, do, do. Eh, never mind. Oh shit. This place is huge. What's up with this? How are the candles light lit up like that? Huh. Hey, Stolas. Otis. Getty? What are you guys doing here? Solas? What are you doing here? Are you the one who stole the relics from the pirates? Dot dot dot. I'm sorry. I, I trust you, Otis, but I can't involve anyone else in this. Okay, what are you doing, dude? I'm sorry, but, but I don't have time to explain. Please leave. Hey, hey wait up! We have to catch up to him. Whomp. Ooh, 
Ooh, platforming section, okay. Ah, ah, okay. gonna take some getting used to. Okay. There we go. Kinda sounded like it broke weird. Hey, Stolas. Hey! Wait up! How did you guys end up behind me? Solus! We just want to help you. The pirates are coming after you. I know. Then let us help. Let's get rid of the relics and... N no! I'm going to use the relics. What? Huh? I don't have time to explain this to you. Just get out of here. Dot dot dot. Hurry guys, we need to tuck some sense into Sol Solus. Wait, no. Oh, this is- is this final boss arena? Oh, what the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? Huh, huh, huh. Oh, whoop, there we go, okay. Hmm. Okay, there we go. Huh. What am I supposed to do there? Okay. Damn it, I was almost there. Okay. I forgot. Stop flying. I'm not trying to fly. Come on. supposed to roll. Eh. Okay. Hmm. Okay, let's see. Uh Hmm. Oh, there we go. Okay. 
Come on. Come on. Come on, Otis. Uh, Otis. Otis. <laughs> For God's sakes. We need to fly at the last minute, I think, for that bit. <laughs> of all the- of all the things. Of all the things to give me difficulty in, like, the last section of platforming. Easy baby platforming. <laughs> this is embarrassing. Did it. Otis! Get up, buddy. We're not at the end just yet. Oof. There you go. Okay, guys, let's keep moving. <sighs> okay, save point. Oh, what do you see? What is this place? Come on, come on. Okay. Ah. Okay, I need to go over to the other one. This is embarrassing. <laughs> 
I'm a little embarrassed. <laughs> This is a fun glitch, huh? Be careful. I should stop rushing. Please save. What? Read. Oh, fuck. Hmm, what's this? This book is ancient, but I can read it. Dot, dot, dot. Book of Nocte, volume one. A owl temple. First of the great temples. Here, the owls learned how to control the elements and challenge the natural order. By the end of the first aeon, they had mastered water, fire, and wind. In their work, he revealed to them um, the existence of the higher mysteries. It was here that the existence of the loop was hypothesized. Oh no. The existential anguish from this discovery of the loop per permeated owl society. Riots began and the owl temple was abandoned. Fuck. Oh, so here we get some lore. Book of Nocte, Volume 2. The Floating Continent, greatest of the owl homes. The machines produced here were the finest the world has ever seen. For the first time, owl technology surpassed the capabilities of life itself. There seemed to be no end to the heights the owls could reach. They were determined to break the loop and work tirelessly to advance their technology and knowledge. Finally, the solution was presented, a hex that would upend the laws of the universe. But it was a disaster. The hex failed and the world would never be the same. Hmm. Oh, here's everyone. Book of Nocte, Volume 3. The Floating Tower gigantic research facility in the sky built without the knowledge of the world at large. The last few owls gathered here, far away from the famines and wars elsewhere. The 
great relics that were used to create the hex were reforged. But the owls were preparing another hex. Greater than the last, this new hex would send the world crashing downwards. And, and bring the world under the owl's control once again. Oh, fuck. Owls were evil. So that's the truth he wasn't telling us. He's been making the ancient owls out to be heroes and scholars and whatnot. And in reality, he's going to use the relics for power, just like Malstrom. I knew it. We have no choice now. We shall have to stop him ourselves. Yeah, we're the only ones up here. Dot, dot, dot. Let's go. There's no time to waste. Hmm. Is there anything... Okay, so... Hmm. Whoa, whoa. Well, what was that about? Oh shit, what's going on here? Oh shit. Shit, okay. Okay. should reset that. Oh, 
Where do I go? Oh, I could go up. Okay. Oh, thank God. That's the one, the one problem with no flying. <sighs> oh, hey, oh, okay. I just can't course correct. <laughs> the hell did Stolas fly up here? <sighs> okay, cutscene. Oof. Ugh. <sighs> hey guys. Oh man, where are we rising to? I think I can see the top of the tower above us. If we stay on this platform, we could still make it to where Stolas is. Okay. I don't know what's going on. Me neither. Try to hold on. Whoops, there I go. Okay, come on. How am I supposed to get- oh my god. 
I'm gonna move over to the left now. Just missed it by a millimeter. Okay. Son of a bitch. How did I get so high last time? These rocks need to come up faster <laughs> or something. Okay. <sighs> we'll see how long this takes. Oof. I guess I just have to- I'm supposed to memorize the falling rock patterns? That's annoying. I hate that. Bye everyone. over here. Stay afloat, Otis. Oh, okay. Seen what's happening? The fucking ah! Oh my god, it's coming undone. Oh, now I guess I have to dodge pieces of shit. I can dodge. Boy. Hey, everyone. Dot, dot, dot. I can't believe it. I believe we are witnessing the end of the world, my friends. We ourselves are floating. The floating continents are rising into space? This is the end. 
It's happening so suddenly. What has Solus done up there? Yeah. Whatever Solus is doing up there, we have to stop him. I see his tower above us. Let's go. Can I? Okay. Okay, so now we can fly. Oh, that's not good. Oh, no. Oh, no, that's a bad statue. Oh, no, what's it doing? Here we go. Yep, everyone's safe. Solus, what the fuck are you up to here? Oh, cool. One fruit. Thanks. It probably ultra heals me. Actually, I want to try it. Hmm. Solus, what the fuck are you up to? <laughs> huh? How did you get up here? Never mind that, Solus. <laughs> Never mind that, thanks. No. Okay. Something about quickly. I've, I've to told you already. I'm not interested in what you have to say. But I'm using the relics. To do what? That's all. I'm nearly finished here. Please don't get in my way. I call upon the power of the hex relics. Okay. I don't like this, Otis. I thought Solus was our pal, but he just isn't listening at all. Not to us, anyway. Yeah. I'm not sure what to do. If he doesn't listen, we may have to stop him. I told you, don't disturb me. I'm at a critical stage in the process. I have to extract the relic's essence. It'll be done soon. Y you're free to leave, you know. You're just bothering me. I'm through talking to you. Back. Dude. What are you doing? Have you gone mad? Snap out of it, Solus. The relics are too dangerous. Have you forgotten what happened to Advent? N no one can use them ever. You have to destroy them. You have to see sense, Solus. We will help you avoid the pirates' retribution, but please stop this. Using the relics for power will only make things worse. That's right. We'll stop you if we have to. Dot, dot, dot. I don't have time for this. I've been telling you guys to leave me alone. I gave you lots of chances. Tell us what you're using it for, idiot! But it's clear that you guys don't understand. Yeah, because you haven't said shit! So I guess I just have to make you leave. Oh, cool. Oh, shit, we have to fight him. <laughs> oh, fuck. Oh, okay. Okay. Oh, what the shit is that? Yeah, oh, oh, okay.
Okay. I'll be honest, I have no idea what I'm doing. Okay. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> what the hell is this? Memories of Bailey fled back to you. Remain in the present. Huh. Actually... Maybe there's a clue here. But if I have to backtrack all the way through that hot nonsense to get here, I'm reloading a save, I think. Hmm. Anything I could read here? Hmm. to get beyond the mesosphere. Not sure. Okay. Okay, I don't think this is going to lead to anything. Hmm. Present beckons you.
not what I wanted to do. Ah. I bet I have to get rid of all three relics. For God's sakes. Okay. Maybe the going back in time is to help you get better items or the trinkets or whatever. I don't know. Okay, whatever. Don't know what that was about. Hmm.
Come on. I don't think there's a way to get more health at this point. Hmm. Oof. Solace. Oh, what? Again? Third time?
<laughs> okay. Guess we're gonna have to do this six times. Excuse me. <laughs> Solus, what's going on? <laughs> Solus, dude. Erg. No. I... I can't move. Now you listen to us. Stop this power crazy stuff. Using the relics is going to get people hurt. No, you're wrong. I'm trying to help. By using the relics? Don't you remember Advent? Those things are weapons. No. 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 No, okay, Solace. Explain time. That's not what the relics were made for. That's just how Molstrom used them. Okay. Please explain, Solace. I didn't want to tell you this, but I need you to understand. I'm going to tell you of the great shame of the owls, the hex, and the anti hex. Okay. Relics were created long ago when the owls lived at the planet's surface and the floating islands did not exist. Owl technology was beyond our imagination and the owls studied the deeper secrets of the universe. Relics were made after the owls made a fateful discovery. A discovery that sent owl society into infighting and chaos. The Loop Okay. What is the loop? I'm not certain, but the owls were obsessed with it. They worked for centuries in a desperate struggle to find a way to end the loop. Finally, they found a solution. A hex that would alter the laws of nature to end the loop forever. The relics were designed to be fuel for the hex. Centuries after they were made, the owls were finally ready for their hex. So what happened? Did the hex work? Dot dot dot. It was the biggest disaster in the history of the planet. I don't even know if the hex broke the loop. It should have been the least of their worries. Hex backfired, shattering the planet's continents into floating islands in the sky. And the planet was reduced to a giant empty ocean. Cool. And the islands are still rising. You must have seen it outside. The world is ending. Time is running out. In a matter of days, we'll have to will have risen to cold, unbreathable space. But the anti-hex. You mentioned something about an anti-hex. 
This library was built to find a way to bring the planet's expansion under control and reverse it. When I found it, I learned that the owls created relics which have been absorbing power for centuries. Now they are ready to be used for the anti-hex, which will bring the islands back down to the ocean. That is what I'm preparing. An anti-hex to save the world. Okay. So why didn't you just say that? Man. You should have told us, Solace. Exactly. Why did you try to do this all on your own? Exclamation points. I... I didn't. I got the pirates to help me by promising them power. Tricking the pirates led to the destruction of Advent Solace. I just... I didn't know of anyone I could, who I could trust. Dot dot dot. Let us help you finish this anti-hex. Come on, Solace. What do you have to? What do we have to do? I. I. Just have to. Oh no. Is that? The pirates. Owl boy. You traitor. I'm coming for you. Okay. Now we have to fight Molstrom. Captain is here. Get outside. The world is. Oh shit, it's all coming apart. Dot, dot. Exclamation points, you have run off with my relics, owl boy. You dare betray me? I haven't betrayed you, Molstrom. I'm trying to save you and everyone else. Trying to prevent the planet from being destroyed. Yeah! Ow, what the fuck? No. Otis, are you alright? No, he's not. So you're saving the world, is that it? Why would I care if the planet's destroyed? Give the relics back to me now. Please, I can't. Erg. Otis, take this. Yay, magic upgrade. <laughs> what happened? Is Master Otis breathing? Yes. Good, get him out of here. Keep the captain at bay. Hurry, Master Getty, twig. Can't hold him for long. Uh, uh. We have to get up Otis up. Hurry up and get away, Otis. We'll hold him back. Twig, follow me. Hurry, Otis. Otis! We can't run away. Please, I can't move. I have to complete the anti-hex. Repair the totem. Hopefully that will be enough. up. Dude, come on, let's fly. Fly. Ah! What the fuck? Okay. Okay. Come on, come on. We got this, Otis.
Okay, he's gonna... There we go. Oh, just get out of here. Good, my friends. Oh, jeez. Oof. Oh, what the fuck? Ow. Who does... Did we just get shot? Oh no. The, the anti-hex. It's emerging from his body. But is he... Hmm? So this is what your treachery is about? You think this is enough to stop me? Not really. Ha! I'll crush this little hex of yours. Oh, here he goes. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> Otis! Someone help Otis. Here I go, getting another <laughs> concussion. Huh. I'm glowing. Huh. Hey. What is how school how has school been lately? I hear Asio might take you under his wing soon. I'm a baby, you're so lucky, Otis. Oh, it baby Otis. Hi, little Otis. Want to drop by my place sometime with Fib and Bonacci? We'll play drums till the sun sets. Hi there, youngin. Want to join me in the hot spring? No? You're a hard worker, Otis. Just like the other owls. Otis, do say hi to Lydia and Scops for me. I hear you'll be studying under Asia soon. He handpicked you, I heard, and I'm glad he did. I think you two will be a great fit. Oh my god, what? Am I dead? Otis, I'm glad you're doing well. You you don't recognize me? It's Solus. Listen, um, don't know if you think of me as a friend, but I always thought of you as my, my only friend. I hope the next time we meet, it'll be under different circumstances. There's so, so much I want to tell you. Yeah, I hope we meet under different circumstances as well. Asio. Oh, Otis is doing the little nervous thing, isn't he? This is the cemetery. Welcome, Otis. Very glad to see you again. Probably wondering where you are. Yeah, you're not dreaming. I'm seeing visions of the past and the future. And from today, you may not remember any of it, but it is real. You grew up with good people, Otis. Full of affection for you and hopes for your future and regret for things said and done. I hope so. These visions are our gift to you. The, the truth, I think, is often the greatest gift, especially since people are so prone to forgetting things they should cherish most. You must have many questions. 
Come, sit down. Dot, dot, dot. Is everyone going to be okay? Aww! Getty, Alphonse, Twig, and all the rest. Yes, Otis. You succeeded out there. The fact that you're here means that the anti-hex worked. What will happen now? The islands will be sinking. Your generation will know the surface, as we did. Oh shit, you're old. Thanks to you, the world will be whole once again. It will be difficult to adjust to life on the surface after all this time. But it will be overcome. I hope you don't blame us for what we've put you through. We tried to change the universe and we paid a price for that. You paid that price too. In order to end the loop, we were willing to do anything. And risk our future, your present. Dot, dot, dot. I'm not sure I understand. Doesn't matter. All you need to know is that we wanted to discover the nature of the universe, and in doing so, we lost ourselves. Maybe one day, in this life or the next, you will learn about the loop. But there are far more rewarding things to learn about the universe than how it ends. Probably worried that this is the end for you. Don't worry. In this world we've created, there's always a second chance. I feel like they're talking about video games. Our time is up. I know I'm not the only one, but... I've always believed in you, Otis. That's very sweet, thanks. Hope I don't die. I probably won't. There I go. I'm gonna plunge into the ocean at Mach 10. Oh fuck, there's the ocean. Terminal velocity. Oh! <laughs> Created by D Pad Studio. Oh, cool. Okay. <laughs> so that was the end. Aw. That was a little bittersweet. I hope my concussion isn't too bad. <laughs> Aw. That's really sweet. I gotta say, props to all those people. This is an excellent music track. Testing, very important. Troy Mossman, that's the greatest name, Mossman. Ooh, the translation. Oh, translations. Hmm. Sweet. That was really sweet, guys. Oh shit. Ending. Am I gonna be falling into the water? There I am. That's definitely me falling into the ocean. Jeez. Someone rescue me. I don't think I know how to swim. 
an angry little owl in the ocean. This boy has so many concussions. No wonder he doesn't talk. Oof. Uh, but it kind of seemed to imply at the end that it was, um... Or, uh, okay. <laughs> Uh, I wonder if, like, in the visions he could talk because of magic, or, like, if he was, um... What's the word when, uh, anxiety makes you mute? Um, I forget. Uh... Man, that was sweet, though. Aww. Oh. That was great! It took way less time than I thought it was gonna take. I was given this thing in uh, two hours. <laughs> Oof. That was adorable. Aww. Okay. And we got 2019 coins. Awesome. <laughs> uh. I wonder how many Buccaneary coins there are in total. That's really sweet. Okay. So... Now what? Huh. I think, um... What I want to do... Is, um... I want to do some reading. Uh. Yeah, okay. Okay, let's try something else. Um. Uh, this is cool. Oh. Yeah. Okay, let's, um. Ooh. Uh, let's change the category real quick. Um, boo boo boo. Uh, let's see, a bit of an intermission, yeah. Do do do. Um, Oh shit. Uh blah, blah, blah. Who's the author here? Um this was Virginia Wolf. Okay. Yeah. She's got two O's in her name. Uh, I guess this will be just chatting. Do, 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 not single player. Um, Okay. Stop capitalizing things. Okay. Tried to update some information. Um, okay. Do, do, do. We'll be 
doing some technical difficulties. What are you up to now? Um, I really got to find the correct tags for this, but um, pretty much uh, there we go. Okay. That seems to be doing all right. Um, pretty much what I, I've been wanting to try this for a while. We'll see. Um, yeah, that seems to be good. Uh, we'll just leave the trigger tags as they are, I guess. Um, what I've been wanting to do is, um, so, I'm really into literary analysis, or it's just something I'm interested in, uh, and very frustratingly, um, when I start to look up those kinds of videos, uh, I haven't, I don't really find them. Not too often, anyway. PBS has a good couple shows, um, uh, but most of the time when I go to look it up, um, what authors are really putting out there is writing advice, which I do not give a shit about, I'll be honest. I don't care about receiving it, and I don't care about giving it out. Because, frankly, the best advice is to just keep writing. <laughs> and if you like an author, if you like something that they do, and you want to do that thing in your own work, you should go ask them how they do that thing. And if they're dead, you go to try and find their letters. Um, which they probably were talking to people about how to write. Because, let me tell you, us writers cannot shut up about that. <laughs> anyway. So, what I do want to try is, like, making my own literary analysis. Um. And I thought, um. Maybe a good place to start would be someone like, uh, um, Virginia Woolf. Uh, I've got some of her essays in an old textbook of mine. Um, and, well, specifically I was looking up, uh, oh, this one author that I've forgotten. Let me, I, I'm blanking on her name. Um, Uh, Agatha Christie. I was thinking, hey, I could, I got a library book about Agatha, I got one of Agatha Christie's books from the library, and I thought, hey, this will be a great place to start. Um, but turns out Agatha Christie doesn't have a lot of, uh, works in the public domain. She's kind of at that edge. Um, so I picked out a couple of Con I picked out a couple, um, people who talked about writing, because that's all literary analysis is. Um, Virginia Woolf is one of them, uh, and I thought she was a good fit. One, because she's contemporary, and two, because she's very feminist, and something I noticed about Agatha Christie is that she, um, her works, it's very interesting. I've noticed that she writes very well the point of view of, like, the inner lives of women, um, in a way that a lot of authors just don't, and I'm including, like, women authors in that. A lot of women authors do struggle with this, um, so it kind of stands out to me. 
Uh, so, I don't know, I just thought, like, yeah, reading her from, like, a more feminist perspective would be, uh, pretty useful as a way to look, as a lens to look at her work. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, um, I kind of wanted, I found some stuff that, uh, one of the influence of Agatha Christie's is, um, she went through World War One. uh, it was called the Great War during her time, and that's the war that sparked, you know, um, a lot of people who were young during that time, they, the world just seemed in pieces, which I'm sure no one, <laughs> no contemporary audiences can understand, um, JK, uh, but that's where, um, Oh, uh, that art movement about randomness that we're kind of redoing with memes. Um, shoot, I'm blanking. I had a, I had a, okay. It was, um, yeah, Dada, that's the bitch, Dada, um, yeah, there was the Dada's art movement. I'm not sure if that's, like, if that was a writing movement, I'll be honest. I could not find, for the life of me, writing movements after World War One. but I'm just gonna say Dada, um, <laughs> Yeah. Dada was kind of a, of a thing. Agatha Christie definitely isn't that, isn't Dada. Um, but she does write from, like, sort of a lived perspective. Um, uh, like, these are just real world people doing normal things. Uh, more or less. Uh, so, yeah, um, another influence of hers is, uh, uh, Sherlock Holmes, which I might read something from that vein, because I love Sherlock, um, anyway, yeah, I picked out, um, Virginia Woolf, and then some other stuff that we're pretty much talking about you know, modern fiction and, like, the World War One and that sort of thing. Anyway, let's see what Virginia Woolf has to say about modern fiction. <laughs> uh, in making any survey, even the freest and loosest of modern fiction, it is difficult not to take it for granted that the modern practice of the art is somehow an improvement upon the old. With their simple tools and primitive materials, it might be said. Fielding did well, and Jane Austen even better, but compare their opportunities to ours. With their masterpieces certainly have a strange air of simplicity, and yet the analogy between literature and the process, to choose an example, of making motor cars scarcely holds good beyond the first glance. It is doubtful whether in the course of the centuries, though we have learnt much about making machines, we have learnt anything about making literature. We do not come to write better. All that we can be said to do is to keep moving, now a little in this direction, now in that, but with a circular tendency should the whole course of the track be viewed from a sufficiently lofty pinnacle. It need scarcely be said that we make no claim to stand, even momentarily, upon that vantage ground. On the flat, in the crowd, half blind with dust, we look back with envy to those happier warriors 
whose battle is won, and whose achievements wear so oh, serene an air of accomplishment that we can scarcely refrain from whispering that the fight was not so fierce for them as for us. It is for the historian of literature to decide, for him to say if we are now beginning or ending, or standing in the middle of a great period of prose fiction. For down in the plain little is visible, we only know that certain gratitudes and hostilities inspire us, that certain paths seem to lead to fertile land, others to dust and the desert, and of this, perhaps, it may be worth while to attempt some account. Our quarrel, then, is not with the classics, and if we speak of quarreling with Mr. Wells, Mr. Bennett, and Mr. Glassworthy, it is partly that, by the mere fact of their existence, in the flesh of their work has a living, breathing, everyday imperfection, which bids us take what liberties with it we choose. But it is also true that, while we thank them for a thousand gifts, we reserve our unconditional gratitude for Mr. Hardy, for Mr. Conrad, and in a much lesser degree for the Mr. Hudson of the Purple Land, green mansions, and far away and long ago. Mr. Wells, Mr. Bennett, and Mr. Glasworthy have excited so many hopes and disappointed them so persistently that our gratitude largely takes the form of thanking them for having shown us what they might have done but have not done. What we certainly could not do, but as certainly, perhaps, do not wish to do. No single phrase will sum up the charge or grievance which we have to bring against a mass of work so large in its volume and embodying so many qualities, both admirable and the reverse. If we tried to formulate our meaning in one word, we should say that these three writers are materialists. It is because they are concerned not with the spirit but with the body that they have disappointed us, left us with the feeling that the sooner English fiction turns its back upon them as politely as may be, and marches, if only into the desert, the better for its soul. Naturally, no single word reaches the center of three separate target targets. In the case of Mr. Wells, it falls notably wide of the mark. And yet, even with him, it indicates to our thinking the fatal alloy in his genius, the great clod of clay that has got itself mixed up with the purity of his inspiration. But Mr. Bennett is perhaps the worst culprit of the three, inasmuch as he is by far the best workman. He can make a book so well constructed and solid in its craftsmanship that it is difficult for most ex for the most exacting of critics to see through what chink or crevice decay can creep in. There is not so much as a trot between the frames of the windows or a crack in the boards. And yet, if life should refuse to live there, that is the risk which the creator of the old wives' tale, George Cannon, Edward Clayhanger, and hosts of other figures, may well claim to have surmounted. His characters live abundantly, even unexpectedly, but it remains to ask how do they live, and what do they live for? More and more they seem to us deserting even the well-built villa in the five towns to spend their time in some softly padded first-class railway car car carriage pressing bells and buttons innumerable, and the destiny to which they travel so luxuriously becomes more and more unquestionably an eternity of bliss spent in the very best hotel in Britain. It can scarcely be said of Mr. Wells that he is a materialist in the sense that he takes too much delight in the solidity of his fabric. His mind is too generous in its sympathies to allow him to spend much time in making things shipshape and substantial. 
He is a materialist for the sh from sheer goodness of heart, taking upon his shoulders the work that ought to have been discharged by government officials. And in the plethora of his ideas and facts, scarcely having leisure to realize or forgetting to think important, the crudity and coarseness of, of his human beings Yet what more damaging criticism can there be both of his earth and his heaven that they are to be inhabited here and hereafter by his Jones and his Peters? Does not the inferiority of their natures tarnish whatever institutions and ideals may be provided for them by the generosity of their creator? Nor profoundly, though we respect the integrity of humanity, of Mr. Galsworthy, shall we find that we seek in his pages. If we fasten, then, one label on all these books, on which is one word, materialists, we mean by it that they write of unimportant things, that, that they spend immense skill, immense industry, making the trivial and transitory appear the true and the endearing. We have to admit that we are exacting, and further, what, that we find it difficult to justify our discontent by explaining what it is that we exact. We frame our question differently at different times, but it, appe but it reappears most persistently as we drop the finished novel on the crest of a sigh. Is it worthwhile? What is the point of it all? Can it be that owing to one of these little deviations, which the human spirit seems to make from time to time, Mr. Bennett has come down with his magnificent apparatus for catching life just an inch or two on the wrong side? Life escapes, and perhaps without life nothing is worthwhile. It is a confession of vagueness to have, ma eh, to, have to make use of such a figure as this, but we scarcely better the matter by speaking, as critics are prone to do, of reality. Admitting the vagueness which afflicts all criticism of novels, let us hazard the opinion that for us at this moment, the form of fiction most in vogue more often misses than secures the thing we seek. Whether we call it life or spirit, Truth or reality, this, the essential thing, has moved off, or on, and refuses to be contained any longer in such ill-fitting vestments as we provide. Nevertheless, we go on perseveringly, conscientiously, constructing our two and thirty chapters after a design which more and more ceases to resemble the vision in our minds. So much of the enormous labor of proving the solidity, the likeness to life of the story is not merely labor thrown away, but labor misplaced to the extent of obscuring and blotting out the light of the conception. The writer seems constrained, not by his own free will, but by some powerful and unscrupulous tyrant who has him in thrall to provide a plot to provide comedy tragedy love interest and an air of probability embalming the whole so impeccable that if it, all his figures were to come to life they would find themselves dressed down to the last button of their coats in the fashion of the hour the tyrant is obeyed the novel is done to a turn but sometimes more and more often, as time goes by, we suspect a momentary doubt, a spasm of rebellion, as the pages fill themselves in the customary way. Is life like this? Must novels be like this? Look within, and life, it seems, is very far from being like this. Examine for a moment an ordinary mind on an ordinary day. The mind receives a myriad impressions, trivial, fantastic, 
evanescent, <laughs> evanescent, <laughs> or engraved with the sharpness of steel. From all sides they come, an incessant shower of innumerable atoms, and as they fall, as they shape themselves into the life of Monday or Tuesday, the accent falls differently from, an, uh, from of old. The moment of importance came not here because came not here, but there, so that if a writer were a free man and not a slave, if he could write what he chose, not what he must, if he could base his work upon his own feeling and not upon convention, there would be no plot, no comedy, no tragedy, no love interest or catastrophe in the accepted style and perhaps not a single button sewn on as the Bond Street tailors would have it. Life is not a series of gig lamps symmetrically arranged, but a luminous halo, a semi-transparent envelope surrounding us from the beginning of consciousness to the end. It is not the task of the novelist to convey this varying, this unknown and uncircumscribed spirit, whatever apparition or complexity it may display. With as, much, with as little mixture of the alien and external as possible. We are not pleading merely for courage and sincerity. We are suggesting that the proper stuff of fiction is a little other than custom have us believe it. It is, at any rate, in some such fashion as this, that we seek to define the quality with which distinguishes the work of several young writers, among whom Mr. James Joyce is the most notable, from that of their pre predecessors. They attempt to come closer to life and to preserve more sincerely and exactly what interests and moves them. Even if they do so, they must discard most of the convictions which are commonly observed by the novelist. I heard the dog. Let me let him in. One second. Hi, Pookie. You want to hear me read some stuff? What? What, my sweets? Mm. Are you a baby boy, huh? Huh? What? You are such a baby. You are a little baby. And you're in the way. I'm trying to sit down. Let me sit down. Hmm. Okay. You done? You being a baby? Okay. Let us record the atoms as they fall upon the mind in the order in which they fall. Let us trace the pattern, however disconnected and incoherent in appearance, which each sight and in or incident scores upon the consciousness. Let us not take it for granted that life exists more fully in what is commonly thought big than in what is commonly thought small. Anyone who has read the portrait of the young artist as a man, or what promises to be far more interesting work, Ulysses, now appearing in the Little Review, will have hazarded some theory of, its, of this nature as to Mr. Joyce's intention. On our part, with such a fragment before us, it is a hazard ra rather than affirmed. But whatever the intention of, of the whole, there can be no question but that it is of the, most, of the utmost sincerity and that the result, difficult or unpleasant as we may judge it, is undeniably important. In contrast, with those whom we have called materialists, Mr. Joyce is a spiritual. He is concerned at all costs to reveal the flickering of the at intermost flame which flashes its messages through the brain. And in order to preserve it, 
He disregards with complete courage whatever seems to him advantageous, whether it be probability or coherence or any of the or any other of these signposts which for generations have served to support the imagination of a reader when called upon to imagine what he can neither touch nor see. The scene in the cemetery, for instance, with its brilliancy, its sordidity, its co incoherence, its sudden lightning flashes of significance, does undoubtedly come so close to the quick of the mind that, on the first reading, at any rate, it is difficult not to acclaim a masterpiece. If we want life itself here, surely we have it. Indeed, we find ourselves fumbling rather awkwardly if we try to say that we uh, that say what else we wish, and for what reason a work of such originality yet fails to compare. For we must take his high examples with youth or the mayor of Casterbridge. It fails because of the comparative poverty of the writer's mind. We, mu we might sim say simply and have done with it. But it is possible to press a little further and what wonder whether we may, may not refer our sense of being in a bright yet narrow room, confined and shut in, rather than enlarged and set free to some limitation imposed by the method as well as by the mind. It is the method that inhibits the creative power. Is it the method that inhibits the creative power? Is it due to the method that we feel neither jovial nor magnanimous, but centered in a self which, in spite of its tremor of susceptibility, never embraces or creates what is outside itself? and beyond does the emphasis laid perhaps didactically upon indecency contribute to the effect of something angular and isolated or is it merely that in any effort of such originality it is much easier for contemporaries especially to feel what it lacks than to name what it gives in any case, it is a mistake to stand outside examining methods. Any method is right, every method is right, that expresses what we wish to express. If we are writers, that brings us closer to the novelist's intention if we are readers. This method has the merit of bringing us closer to what we were prepared to call life itself. Did not the reading of Ulysses suggest how much of life is excluded or ignored? It did not, and did it not come with a shock to open Tristram Shandy, or even Pendensis, Pendennis, okay, Pendennis, and be th by them convinced that they err are not only other aspects of life, but more important ones into the bargain. However. This may be the problem before the novelist at present, as we suppose it to have been in the past, is to contrive means of being free to set down what he chooses. He has to have the courage to say that what interests him is no longer this, but that. Out of that alone must he construct his work. For the moderns, that, the point of interest, lies very likely in the dark place of places of psychology. At once, therefore, the accent falls a little differently. The emphasis is upon something hitherto ignored. At once, a different outline of form becomes necessary, difficult for us to grasp, incomprehensible to our predecessors. No one but a modern, perhaps no one but a Russian, would have felt the interest of the situation which Chekhov has made into the short story he calls Gusev. Some Russian soldiers lie ill on board a ship which is taking them back to Russia. We are given a few scraps of their talk and some of their thoughts. Then one of them dies and is carried away. The talk goes on among the others for a time until Gusev himself dies, 
and looking like a carrot or a radish, is thrown overboard. The emphasis is laid upon such unexpected places that at first it seems as if there were no emphasis at all. And then, as the eyes accustom themselves to twilight and discern the shapes of things in a room, we see how complete the story is, how profound and how truly in obedience to his vision Chekhov has chosen this, that, and the other, and placed them together to compose something new. But it is impossible to say this is, a, this is comic or this is tragic, nor are we certain since short stories we have all we have been taught should be brief and conclusive whether this which is vague and inconclusive should be called a short story at all the most elementary remarks upon modern in modern english fiction can hardly avoid some mention of the russian influence and if the russians are mentioned one runs the risk of feeling that to write of any fiction save theirs is waste of time if we want understanding of the soul and heart where else shall we find it of comparable profundity if we are sick of our own materialism the least considerable of their novelist has by right of birth an unnatural reverence for the human spirit Learn to make yourself akin to people, but less Levi. Okay, I'll let him out. What? A blue on your face. There you go. Have fun. But let this sympathy be not with the mind, for it is easy with the mind, but with the heart, with love towards them. In every great Russian writer, we seem to discern the features of a saint. If sympathy for the suffering of others, love towards them, endeavor to reach some goal worthy of the most exacting demands of the spirit, constitute saintliness. It is the saint in them which confounds us with a feeling of our own irreligious triviality and turns so many of our famous novels to tinsel and trickery. The conclusions of the Russian mind, thus comprehensive and compassionate, are inevitably, perhaps, of the utmost sadness. More accurately, indeed, we might speak of the inconclusiveness of the Russian mind. It is the sense that there is no answer, that, if honestly examined, life presents question after question, which must be left to sound on and on after the story is over in hopeless interrogation that fills us with a deep fi and finally, it may a be with a resentful despair. They are right, perhaps, unquestionably, they see further than we do, and, and without our gross impediments of vision. But perhaps we see something that escapes them, or why should this voice of protest mix itself with our gloom? The voice of protest is the voice of another, and an ancient civilization which seems to have bred in us the instinct to enjoy and fight rather than to suffer and understand. English fic fiction, from Stern to Meredith, bears witness to our natural delight in humor and comedy, in the beauty of the earth, in the activities of the intellectual, and in the splendor of the body. But any deductions that we may draw from the comparison of two fictions, so insurmountably far apart, are futile, save, indeed, as they flood us with a view of the infinite possibilities of the art and remind us that there is no limit to the horizon, and that nothing, no method, no experiment, even of the wildest, is forbidden, but only falsity and pre pretense. The proper stuff of fiction does not exist. Everything is the proper stuff of fiction. Every feeling, every thought, 
every quality of brain and spirit is drawn upon. No perception comes amiss. And if we can imagine the art of fiction come alive and standing in our midst, she would undoubtedly bid us break her and bully her, as well as honor and love her. For so her youth is renewed and her sovereignty assured. Okay. Huh. All right. Um. So let's see. What do we make of this? Um. For one, she mentions quite a lot of authors, most of whom I haven't read. Um. But I. And I do think that might be important to understanding this, um, especially her examples. Uh, so that might be something to look into if we wanted to dig a little deeper. But I do know one author, Trist she mentioned Tristam Shandy. Uh, no, that's a book, not an author. Um, Tristam Shandy. That is an interesting no um that's an there it is. Uh Tristam Sham Andy. An interesting book. Um I read oh like a about the first third of it for class or so. I've been meaning to finish it. Um <laughs> The book is split into it was serialized a lot of older books were serialized in which was it kind of an interesting thing um but that one specifically the author was told he was going to die by the by his doctors and every chapter he wrote he thought that was going to be his last chapter, the last thing he wrote, um, and death does kind of persist through the whole book, and so does absurdity at it all. Um, so it is interesting that she mentions this. Um, this method has the merit of bringing us closer to what we prepared to call life itself. Did not the reading of Ulysses suggest how much of life is excluded or ignored? And did it not come with a shock to open Tristram Shandy or even Pendesis, Pendennis and be by them convinced that, that, that there are not other aspects of life, but more important ones into the bargain? Okay. Um. Hmm. So this is my interpretation of this text but it seems like I can see the it does have a very Dada-esque vibe which is um especially like this line the proper the proper stuff of fiction does not exist everything is the proper stuff of fiction yeah um she seems to be rejecting uh, the notion that writing should follow some kind of um, some kind of standard set by other authors and previous authors and that sort of thing which I do agree with um, hmm Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. How we should remember this when we read Agatha Christie. Um, I wonder if Virginia Woolf would have agreed with, would have, um, Agreed with Agatha Christie's ex uh, writing, or like, um, 
Thought of it as worthwhile, I guess. She seems to think that... Huh. Um... We are not pleading merely for courage and sincerity. We are suggesting that the pro proper stuff of fiction was little more than custom would have us believe it. I wonder if, in her eyes, Agatha Christie would be seen as conforming too much to custom, or what. Um. Hmm. this is just one lens um and it does seem to me that she criticizes those sorts of quote-unquote well-built novels that are classics hmm something to think about um <laughs> Uh, let's see. I do think something I want to talk about is um, when she says in the beginning uh, the thing about um, writers in the present don't necessarily write better than the writers of the past and that there's kind of a circular direction to writing skill. And I have seen that. It is... It is interesting. Um, that as things like technology improves, you can, like, look past... Look to the past, see inventions that were done and like learn how to improve upon them in noticeable ways. Uh, like you can make, like, um, like the cavemen had spears and stuff. And then uh, we learned about aerodynamics and how to make our thrown objects move faster and truer and that kind of thing. And even we learned that we didn't have to throw them. We made, like, mechanical arms, like, um, like gunpowder is a, one thing. Or I've been watching, uh, railgun videos and that sort of deal. Um, <laughs> something that can throw much farther than we, than the human body ever could with just musculature. Um... But it's hard to do that with writing, which is quite odd. You'd think that we could, um, that you could study the past and get the same sort of effect. Where you see, um, like the techniques that Shakespeare used um, and then use those same things to improve upon his work. And I do, like, I do think that we have improved upon Shakespeare's work. Um, like, I do think that there are a number of adaptations, um, specifically of Shakespeare that I think are better than him. Um... But, like, at the same time, those are all opinions. Art is kind of very much opinion-based. Um, like, I think Virginia Woolf is correct in that not everything needs to be super realistic. Um, like, I have read a couple novels 
that try to make the people the lives of the people in them as realistic as possible and it is kind of boring I'll be honest it's a little tiring um hell I remember trying to do that back when I was a baby wee baby <laughs> and I just kind of went into because okay I just kind of went into detail of things that weren't really necessary for anything I was doing but I was having fun so I do think there's merit in that and perhaps Virginia Woolf would see that there's merit in that just because um uh something about um the uncircumscri uncircumscribed spirit uh is it not the task of the novelist to convey this varying, this unknown and uncircumscribed spirit, whatever aberration or complexity it may display, with as little mixture of the alien and external as possible? We are not leading. Okay. Hmm. Life is not a series of gig lamps symmetrically arranged, but a luminous halo. Hmm. It does sound like she's advocating for a little weirdness in novels. A little don't describe every fucking button on the dude's coat for goddamn sake. But more describe the sort of what are the feelings you wish to convey. Hmm. Yeah. Perhaps that's what she was talking about. Don't go into so much detail. It's okay to leave it up to the readers to just imagine whatever the fuck you want. Um. Oh, uh, which I do need to practice doing. Hmm. Maybe reading Tristram Shandy, Tristram Shandy would be good for this, uh, for this little project. Um, hmm. It's interesting that she calls the Russians, uh, to have, says they have a lot of sympathy for others, or sympathy for the suffering of others. Um. <laughs> Uh, cause a lot of Russian work is depressing as all hell. Um. She seems to be praising them in a way. Huh. She calls them a saint. That's funny. Hmm. Hmm. How would I... It is the sense that there is no answer, that if life, uh, that if honestly examined, life presents question after question, which must be left to to sound on and on after the story is over in hopeless interrogation, that fills us with a deep and deep and finally it may be with a resentful despair. Fills us with a deep despair. Okay, um. Hmm. Yeah, I think she's proposing a little more vagueness in stories. Huh. A little more vagueness, a little more feeling stuff. I do want to read her essay on um, Shakespeare's sister, but I don't think that one's public domain quite yet a good one I think it would be a proper fit um hmm hmm 
Look within life, and it seems so very far from being like this. Examine for a moment an ordinary... Okay, yeah. Must novels be like how... I think the core of this is... Must novels be how convention says they should be? And I think the answer to that is no. Um, it's a little complicated because, I mean, at the heart of it, art is just art. It's just a thing. I think art is something that humans create in the same way that birds sing and that bees make hives and all sorts of deals like that. Flowers just bloom and they just do that. And I think humans create art. It's just something intrinsic to ourselves. So, of course, there shouldn't be any kind of convention about what writing should be. Um, <laughs> uh, I haven't planned any of this, so, like, I didn't read this ahead of time, so sorry um, if it's a little out of whack. But, um, art... <laughs> I, in ideal circumstances, art would be a reflection of the humanity of the person creating it. Unfortunately, we don't really exist in ideal um, circumstances. There are people who you have. To, there are people who have to make money off of writing and I don't think that has any less of value um, for trying to fit into a convention uh, just because I think that also shows something like um, a sort of fossilization of life at a moment. Uh, like finding um, shards of a bull at a dig site and learning, hey, this is what the bull was used for. This is what people thought was a good idea to paint or carve into the clay, um, this is how it broke. Uh, I think those little normal things are, do have some use, do, there's something special to them, I should say. It's, you don't really need to Put your heart into every piece you make, you know? Like, it's nice when you do, but sometimes it keeps you from creating. And I do think that making art is kind of the best thing you can do. Um, it's like, making art is real good for you, good for the soul, that kind of thing. It's part of just being a human. And if you make art because you need to sell it so that you can eat or you want to trade it or whatever, goods and services and capitalism, I don't think it's wrong to not put yourself into it, you know? Um, maybe... I know a lot of, I know a lot of idealists wouldn't really agree with that, but man, I think you just, 
I've seen a lot of people be nervous about, you know, sharing something they're very proud of just because they're like, I put my whole heart and soul into this and I don't want people to criticize it or say mean things about it or anything like that. And I'm like, you could just don't put your heart and soul into it. Your skill is still going to be there. You're still good at it. You're as good at making... <laughs> like, if you're, if you're laying bricks in the same way for a thousand houses, you're still as good as la at laying bricks as you are when you're laying them for an architecture project you designed and put, like, so much love and time into. You're still fucking good at it. But if you need to let your heart <laughs> sort of rest outside your- rest, um, rest somewhere safe, then that's okay, you know? We don't have to share everything about ourselves. Sometimes you need to, and sometimes you shouldn't, you know? <laughs> uh, yeah. But is life like this? Not really. It's a little hard to perfectly imprint the state of life onto a page. And that's coming from someone who writes a bunch of nature poetry. Like, I kind of purposefully abstract it and make it fit a dream logic just because it's... There isn't a real way to represent a bee. You kind of have to represent the idea of a bee, if that makes sense. <laughs> It probably it doesn't. Um, oh well, but that's fun. Hmm. I do think she's right about there is no, all, everything is the proper stuff of fiction. You should just, you know, do whatever. Yeah. If you don't need to, like, make a living off of art, or if you're just like, I write for fun and I don't care, then do it. Who cares? Yeah. Do some weird experimental shit that everyone looks at and is like, what the fuck are you on about, man? <laughs> just do that. It's whatever. Written April 1919. When the hell was that? It was a long ass time ago. Hmm. Was this written before or after World War One or during? It could have been during. I don't actually know when World War One happened. I don't even remember when World War Two happened. I'm like, hmm. My knowledge of history is bad. <laughs> I mostly know generalities and not at all dates. Uh. But yeah. Hmm. Well, I thought that was fun. I'm gonna remember, um. Uh, I'm gonna try and remember bits of this. Um. And I think what I would do is, um, I have another, uh, section. Um. Another little bit of, uh, literary analysis, of, uh, uh, literary criticism. And then I think I would read that and then read a passage, um, from Agatha Christie mm. and sort of like, see what lens that gives us of her. Um... I do think it follows, uh, how did Virginia 
Wolf put it. Um, it kind of follows the, um, yeah. It sort of follows the classics a little too closely for Virginia Woolf's taste. But yeah, I think looking at Virginia Woolf was a good idea. Anyway, that was fun. Uh, okay, I forgot to turn that off. Anyway, how about we go find someone to raid, uh, get some dinner. Hmm, that'll be nice. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll turn off that. That was fun. Uh, Twitch, yes. Uh, Twitch is rather odd in that every time I switch from like a writing stream to like any other type of stream, people just don't watch those as often. No idea why, but ooh. Yeah. Well, let's go hang out with coffee quills. Yeah. She's cool. Or they're cool. Yeah, they've got they them pronouns. I forget. They might switch between pronouns. Oh, okay. They, them, but they do ooh, answer to he and she. Okay, cool. Hmm, hmm, hmm. I'm kind of the opposite. I use he, him, I, bleh. I use he, she, and no pronouns. Um, no pronouns and then he, she. Uh, but also answer to, what? Yeah, also answer to the, a, them. Pretty fun. Oh. Okay, let's go read coffee. I like hanging out with coffee. They're cool. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> See you there. I'm probably going to do this more often. Bye.